Psalm 116 is a remarkable psalm having to do with paying a vow of gratitude unto God. Now, it is another one of the six Egyptian Hallel psalms. That's Psalms 113 through Psalm 118. And those are grouped together as a collection because in the ancient world, as well as some in the modern world, the ancient Jews would sing these six psalms as part of their Passover celebrations. They would sing Psalms 113 and 114 before the Passover meal, and they would sing Psalms 115 through Psalm 118 after the Passover meal. And again, this was done since ancient times, and so we have reason to believe that it would have been the common practice in Jesus's day. Now, we understand this, that when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, that was the night that Judas betrayed him to the religious officials and their police force, the night Jesus was arrested, and the night before he was crucified, Jesus had this Passover meal with his disciples, and it says very specifically in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, and Mark chapter 14, verse 26, that singing hymns, probably in that sense, the idea is just of traditional songs, was a part of their celebration, their commemoration of Passover together. We have very good reason to believe that following the normal practice for that time, Jesus and his disciples would have sung Psalm 113 through Psalm 118 at that Passover meal. Now, this means, of course, that they would have sung this psalm that we're going to take a look at today on the night that Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and the night before he was crucified. Now, why do I point this out? Because perhaps more than any other of the five songs in the collection, there's six total, Psalm 116 prophetically gives us the words and the heart of Jesus as he was about to face the ordeal of the cross. Now, we don't know who the author, the human author of Psalm 116 is. It's unattributed. But I, I agree with this statement from the commentator G. Campbell Morgan. He said this, quote, Whatever the local circumstances which gave rise to this song, it is evident that all its rich meaning was fulfilled when in the midst of that little group of perplexed souls, the shadows of the one death already on him, Jesus sang this song of prophetic triumph over the sharpness of the hour of passion to which he was passing. He has made it over to all his own as their triumph song over death. Do, do, do you see what Morgan was saying there? That wh whatever the circumstances were that drove the psalmist to write Psalm 116, all of that is transcended by the person and work of Jesus Christ. And because of our powerful, intimate, real identification with Jesus Christ, his victory becomes our victory. There is a sense not a full sense, of course, but a partial sense in which this song becomes our song because we are identified with Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's sort of a long introduction, but I think this is a remarkable psalm. So having said that, let's take a look now, beginning with verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 116. We read this. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. And notice the opening line of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. The psalmist began his song with the most simple expression of grateful love. <laughs> I love the Lord. I love Yahweh greatly 
because he's answered my prayer in a very desperate season. He heard my voice. He heard my supplications. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. And I love you because of that. I like what Adam Clark had to say about this. Adam Clark was addressing kind of this idea that we should never love God for what he does for us or what he gives for us. We should only love God for who he is. This is what Adam Clark said. He said, how vain and foolish is the talk to love God for his benefits to us is mercenary and cannot be pure love. Whether pure or impure, there is no other love that can flow from the heart of the creature to its creator. And it's true. Listen, when you get right down to it, all of our love to God is a return for things that he has done for us. And so to be able to say, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice shows a very natural and appropriate response. I'll read to you another quote on this point from Charles Spurgeon. He said, quote this, They say that love is blind, but when we love God, our affection has its eyes open and can sustain itself with the most rigid logic. We have reason, super abundant reason, for loving the Lord. Indeed we do. He's heard my voice. I called out to him and he answered. Therefore, look at verse 2. I will call upon him as long as I live. The singer vowed to never call upon any other supposed deity. His allegiance, his love, his prayer would always be to the one who inclined his ear to me, inclined his ear to the psalmist, of course, and to us as well. We say, Lord, you've been so good to me. You are my God forevermore. Now, verses three and four. The pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. You see, in the painful grip of death, that's communicated by the words in verse 3, the pains of death surrounded me. In that painful grip of death, the psalmist knew nothing but trouble and sorrow. This death crisis could have come from many sources. It could have come from sickness. It could have come from injury. It could have come from persecution. But he felt that death was very nearby. Now, interestingly, many centuries later, the apostle Peter used that phrase, the pains of death, to describe the peril from which God the Father delivered Jesus Christ through his resurrection. Uh, you'll find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 24. He says something effective that it was not possible that he should be held by the pains of death. You see, this adds a powerful prophetic and messianic meaning to this psalm. And again, we remind ourselves, this was one of the psalms that Jesus would have sung with his disciples at the Last Supper. You see, understand here, where we read in verse 3, the pains of death, the Hebrew word that's translated pains can also be understood as the ropes or the cords of death. The ropes or the cords of death surrounded me, but you, Lord, you delivered my soul. Now, I wonder, don't you, that perhaps while singing this phrase, Jesus considered the linen windings that would soon be wrapped around his dead body. Again, to quote a commentator here, we read, The cables or the cords of death alluding to their bonds and fetters during their captivity or to the cords which a criminal is bound who is about to be led out to execution or to the bondage in which the dead were enveloped when heads, arms, bodies, and limbs were all laced down together. That was Jesus. He was bound throughout his trials. He was bound to the cross. He was bound in the linen wrappings in which he was buried. But all of those representations of the ropes or cords or pains of death, they could not 
hold them. Why? Because verse 4, Then I called upon the name of the Lord. In his deadly danger, the psalmist cried out to God. He cried out to God in light of all that God is and all that he represents. That's really what's communicated under the title, the name of the Lord. And notice, his cry was very wonderful there. We just read it in verse 4 where it says this. It says, Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. That was his prayer. I'll read you this prayer again. O Lord, I implore you, I beg you, deliver my soul. I want you to understand three things about that brief prayer. Number one, it was a prayer that was delivered straight to God. O Lord was his cry. Secondly, this cry was deeply felt. He said, I implore you, I beg you, I earnestly desire. It was a very deep desire in his soul. Then, thirdly, this cry, this prayer was directly stating the need. He said, Lord, deliver my soul. I I need this. Lord, you got to deliver me. If you don't deliver me, I'm going to be dead. Matter of fact, you could say that Charles Spurgeon noted five great qualities to this brief prayer. Oh, Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. He said, this form of petition is short, comprehensive, to the point, humble, and earnest. Spurgeon went on to say, it is well if all of our prayers were molded upon this model. Perhaps they would be if we were in similar circumstances to those of the psalmist. For real trouble produces real prayer. Isn't that true? Real trouble produces real prayer. And that's exactly where the psalmist was at. Now, he continues on praising God for his deliverance, starting at verse 5, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 7. He says this, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Now notice, he says here in verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. You see, in light of his deliverance through answered prayer, the psalmist praised, notice these phrases in verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. And then he says in the second line of verse 5, Yes, our God is merciful. He praised the gracious, righteous, and merciful character of God. Now again, I want to transport your mind from the psalmist, the author of Psalm 116, composing and singing this song in whatever his circumstances were. I want to transfer you from that over to Jesus gathered with his disciples, singing these lines on the night he would be betrayed and rested, the night before his crucifixion. And before his obedient surrender to the ordeal of his suffering and crucifixion, Jesus sang these words. Jesus testified to the truth that God was gracious, righteous, and merciful. And he did it before, during, and after his ordeal. Lord, even in the midst of what I'm going through, I know you are gracious. I know you are righteous. I know you are merciful. Lord, I know that even though I am being treated unjustly, I know that even though I am severely filled with pain and agony and betrayed by my closest and made to suffer grievously, yet all beyond that, I know that you are gracious, righteous, and merciful. What a powerful thing. Matter of fact, he goes on to say in verse 6, The Lord preserves the simple. You see, in humility, the psalmist counted himself as someone who did not exalt himself above others. He accounted himself as one who might be considered simple. He didn't have to exalt himself because when he was brought low, 
That's when God brought us salvation. <laughs> Lord, I'm fine to identify myself with the humble, with the simple, with the people who aren't all that smart. That's basically the idea uh, behind the word simple. You see, it's not so much the idea as being foolish, as that word is commonly intended in the Bible, but more so because the world considers you to be foolish. Lord, the world looks at me and they think I'm dumb. They think I'm foolish. But Lord, Lord, I understand you preserve the simple. So I'm just going to humbly identify myself with the simple people of this world, the not too smart people, because again, I know this. When I am brought low, that's when you bring your salvation. Again, think about it in its messianic aspect. We consider these words sung and spoken by Jesus among his disciples. He said, Lord, you preserve the simple. You bring your deliverance when I am brought low. Now, understand this. Jesus was almost infinitely far from being a simple man. <laughs> he wasn't a fool. He wasn't an ignorant person in any cause whatsoever. But he was considered to be so by the proud and arrogant religious hierarchy of his day. The religious hierarchy of Jesus's day, they despised his lack of formal credentials and training. They looked at him as a foolish, simple man. And it's as if Jesus here prophetically in the Psalm says, fine, they think of me as simple, Lord, then you will bring forth your salvation to the simple. You'll rescue those who are lowly. And I like the thought of James Montgomery Boyce here on this point. He says this, he says, not only is God gracious, that, that's referring back to the idea in verse five, not only is God gracious, but he is also gracious to the little people, to the plain, to commoners, to the everyday person on the bus or in the shop, to people like the psalmist. This is one of the great glories of our God. When Jesus called his disciples, he called fishermen and tax collectors. When the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they appeared to shepherds. Yes, God continually does great thing for and on behalf of the simple, those who are lowly. And what did he do? Well, he says there in verse six, he saved me. Lord, you saved me. You rescued me. I have experienced your rescue in my life, and I love to talk about it. That's why he can say in verse 7, return to your rest, O my soul. You see, for a season, the death-like crisis had troubled the soul of the psalmist. Clearly, we get this from the psalm. Now, on the other side of it, he can reflect on how God had dealt bountifully with him. And he had come back to a previous standing of rest. There is true rest for our soul in God's bounty. You know, whenever a child of God, even for a moment, we lose our peace, we lose our, our place of just a tranquility with the Lord. We should have this prayer, Lord, I want to return to my rest. You've given me rest in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I want to return to my rest. I make this my prayer. Now, he continues on starting at verse 8, and I'm going to read through verse 11. He's going to describe the testimony of the one who's delivered this way. He says this, verse 8. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. Now, notice this in verse 8. That's a glorious testimony. You've delivered my soul from death. The crisis the psalmist suffered was deep, even unto death. But the, the deliverance was even greater. And it brought comfort to the tearful eyes and strength to the failing feet. Did you see those lines in verse 8? You've delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from failing. You delivered my soul, my eyes, and my feet. You brought great comfort to me. And this powerful praise matched, 
the greatness of the deliverance. Lord, you delivered me so greatly, so completely. I'm going to praise you that greatly, that completely. Again, we understand what an amazing psalm this is just from the perspective of the author of Psalm 116. But once again, we are moved by the thought that Jesus sang these words with his disciples on the night of his betrayal and arrest. And knowing all the suffering that was set before him, Jesus sang with confidence of deliverance from his coming death, his coming tears, and falling under the weight of the cross that was soon to come. Lord, you will deliver me from all of this. And the glorious result, look at there at verse 9. He says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Those were the grateful words of the psalmist after his deliverance. But we can say that these words, I'm going to read them to you again in verse 9. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. These were the grateful words of the psalmist and the confident words sung in faith by Jesus before he suffered every agony of the coming cross. Jesus could go to the cross with full confidence that having been rescued from his failing feet, he would once again walk in the land of the living. Lord, I know you will raise me from the dead. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. That's why he says in verse 10, I believed, therefore I spoke. Full of faith, the psalmist trusted God in the depth of his distress. His was a shadowy preview of the greatest faith. Yes, did the psalmist believe he did, but it was not matched. It was far exceeded by the faith that Jesus demonstrated among his disciples before the cross. Brothers and sisters, I, I am so moved by this thought of Jesus singing with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, I will suffer unto death, but I will be resurrected. And then full of confidence saying in verse 10, I believed, therefore I spoke. My faith is full of assurance. Now, what's interesting in addition to all this, yes, these were the words of the psalmist. Yes, these words were sung full of faith by Jesus the night before his crucifixion. But the Apostle Paul also took this line, I believed, therefore I spoke, and he applied the principle to his own times of trusting God and speaking from the experience of that trust, even in very difficult times. You can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. However, even though he was filled with greater confidence in God, the bitter experience of the psalmist made him consider, look at verse 11, all men are liars. Now, he really came to the conclusion that that was a hasty conclusion that he reached in the midst of his difficulty. We see as well, Jesus, though he was forsaken by all his disciples, all of his partners in song as they sang together these hymns, according to the New Testament, at the Last Supper. Jesus would not come to that same hasty conclusion that the psalmist did. He says in verse 11, I said in my haste, all men are liars. I said it too quickly. Jesus held back from saying that, even though he had reason to say it. Now, it's interesting. The psalmist seems to have regretted that he said all men are liars. But there's at least one way in which the statement is true. I mean, every person will prove to be a liar if you put too much trust in them. If you put too much trust in another person, they're going to let you down. Some people are this way just because they're not capable of keeping every promise. Other people, because they don't intend to keep every promise. But either way you put it, 
If we put too much trust in a person, they will always let us down. Now, the phrasing of this makes it clear that the psalmist understood that he was wrong at this time in saying so. His judgment was too harsh in his present circumstances. That was something that he said in his haste. Yet he understood that at the moment, that's how he felt. Continuing on, verse 12, I would say, begins a second part of this psalm. He's going to talk more now about gratitude, starting at verse 12. So let's take a look at the three verses, beginning at verse 12, verses 12 through 14, where he's going to express his thanksgiving. Look here, starting at verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Now, let's consider this just in terms of the psalmist, the author of Psalm 116. We can see that gratitude drove the psalmist to consider what return he could make unto God. God had so generously shared his benefits making the psalmist grateful and wanting to give something back. He he was something like the one grateful leper among the 10 that Jesus healed, as recorded in Luke chapter 17. So he asks in verse 12, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? God has given me so much that the psalmist wisely considered why God had been so good to him. Why, Lord? What what shall I give to you for all the benefits that you've given to me? In other words, his question is focused. Why has God been so good to me instead of, why have I had any problems? Do, Do you see the change of perspective? Some people in the midst of their difficulties are so focused on their difficulties that their great question is, why, why do I have such problems? Instead, the psalmist, after his deliverance, he says, why was God so good to me? You see, the psalmist understood that problems are common to all men, but the benefits of God's blessing often only belong to those who trust God. So he says, what return can I make to God for all? all his benefits towards me. Notice the benefits are in the plural, all his benefits. It's not just a few, but it's all of them. And when he considers the greatness of all of these benefits, this is what he says in reply. It's remarkable. I will take up the cup of salvation. I want you to think about that just for a moment. A cup of salvation. What do you do with a cup? Well, if you take up a cup, you do it to receive. You you don't take up a cup to give. You may give away a cup to give. But if you take up the cup of salvation, you're there to receive more of God's great salvation towards you. So check this out. Gratitude for blessings received drove the psalmist to receive more from God. Brothers and sisters, this is a very important principle. Before we can do anything for God, we always begin by gratefully receiving. Now look, I believe that we should do things for the Lord. I believe that we should be very busy in giving honor and praise and glory in our service to God and his people. But it can only happen as we continually receive. Now, how do you take up the cup of salvation? Well, I would say that figuratively, we do it when we receive communion. When you receive the bread and the cup of communion, when you drink of that cup, are you not saying, I will take up the cup of salvation? But we also do it We could say in a spiritual sense, every time we receive to ourselves by faith 
the blessing of what Jesus Christ gave to us in the new covenant. This is what God has for us. And we take up the cup of salvation this way. Now, that's for the psalmist in his context. It's for us. But we just simply continue to marvel at how significant it is that Jesus sang these words on the night of his betrayal and arrest, having instituted the cup of salvation, as mentioned here in verse 13, under the new covenant with his disciples. Do do you remember those words that Jesus said at the last supper together with his last disciples, where he held up the cup, one of the ceremonial cups used in the Passover celebration, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. With this cup, he was instituting the new covenant. Jesus received that cup of salvation from his father and he gave it unto his people. It's such a remarkable, deep, profound thought. Again, we just come back to this thought of, we consider it in the psalmist context, we consider it in our context, but in an even greater way, we think of these words on the lips of Jesus. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about this. He said this, Within a very little while after this singing, Jesus in Gethsemane spoke of a cup. And in complete surrender to his father's will, he consented to drink that cup. This was the cup of sorrows, bitterness, of cursing. Having emptied it, he filled it with joy, with sweetness and blessing. When we take that cup, Let us never forget the cost at which he so filled it for us. Yes, Jesus sang these words. I will take the cup of salvation. Verse 14, continuing on here in Psalm 116. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. The singer publicly declared, perhaps in a sacrificial ritual of gratitude at the temple's altar, maybe. He publicly declared God's greatness and faithfulness. He would complete what he had determined to do before God. Hereby, Lord, with what I do right now, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And again, I can't get away from it. How moving it was for Jesus to sing these words when he himself was about to become the sacrifice. Do you understand that Jesus not only made a sacrifice, he was the sacrifice. And in that, he was the absolute fulfillment of the payment of the vow in the presence of God's people. So we take the words of the psalmist, We see how they connect with Jesus on that amazing night in which he sang these six psalms that make up the Egyptian Hallel, those Passover praises, if you will, that the Jews sang together and some still do to this day. But we also apply these words to ourselves as believers today. Uh, Charles Spurgeon noted something that John Fox, that author of Fox's Book of Martyrs, wrote. He said this, Fox, in his Acts and Monuments, relates the following concerning the martyr John Philpot. He went with the sheriffs to the place of execution. Coming to Smithfield, he kneeled down there and saying these words, I will pay my vows in thee. O. Smithfield. You see that English martyr, John Philpot, he had vowed that he would serve the Lord. He had vowed that if necessary, he would lay down his life in martyrdom. And there, at that place of execution of English Protestant martyrs known as Smithfield, he laid down his life. So here, we see the psalm continue now, verses Seven, uh, 15, 16, and 17, starting out verse 15. He says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. 
I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Now, this psalm describes how the psalmist was delivered from death. I mean, we we see that in the very first few verses of the psalm. Verse 3, the pains of death surrounded me and the pangs of shield laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Verse 4, then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. And God delivered him. So the psalm celebrates deliverance from death. But the singer of Psalm 116 knew that death was still a reality for every one of God's saints. Therefore, he says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We, we might put it like this. Death before our time is a crime that we pray to be delivered from. But when it is God's time to take a believer home, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. When that day comes, God holds the death of every one of his people as a very precious thing. God himself has a great concern and nearness to those who are right at death's door. James Montgomery Boyce said it like this. He said this, quote, God is particularly close to his people when they stand at death's door. God watches over his people when they are sick or dying, coming close to them and making his presence known so that they have comfort in death's hour. He also frequently intervenes and does not allow them to perish. In either case, the Lord does what is best. Now, if God regards the death of his people as a precious thing, we should say that God especially regards the death of his martyrs as precious. And this is something that we can never forget. I like what Spurgeon said about this. He said this, Though these martyrs have been cast to the beasts in the amphitheater, or dragged to death by wild horses, or murdered in dungeons, or slaughtered among the snows of the Alps, or made to fatten Smithfield with their gore, precious has their blood been, and it is still in God's sight precious. You see, even though we understand death is a curse, it's an enemy, death is still precious to God and to the believer because it removes the last remaining barriers between God and his saints, and it opens the doorway to an eternity of perfect fellowship with God. Let me, if I could do this, read another Spurgeon quote. I know we're looking at a lot of Spurgeon in Psalm 116, but this quote in particular is so memorable to me. Spurgeon writes this in his great commentary, The Treasury of David. He said, when Baxter lay, he's speaking of Richard Baxter, a great Puritan uh, pastor and commentator. He said, when Baxter lay a dying and his friends came to see him, almost the last word he said was in answer to the question. Dear Mr. Baxter, how are you? And this was his answer. Almost well, said he. And so it is. Death cures. It is the best medicine for they who die are not almost well, but healed forever. Now again, these words that we find here in verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Consider that Jesus sang these words with his disciples on the night before his own death. The words were powerful and prophetic. Jesus was the ultimate saint, holy one, and his death was and is precious beyond all reckoning. Verse 16 continues, O Lord, Truly, I am your servant. The singer dedicated himself to God's service 
on the base of the loosed bonds, on the deliverance that God had given to him. He was set free by God's great works. Both honor and gratitude led him to forever be Yahweh's servant. Now, Adam Clark saw here the words of a bond servant. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. Exodus chapter 21 describes the ceremony for a bond servant. This was the situation of somebody who had been a slave by compulsion, but they so loved their master, they so loved the security and the blessing of the arrangements that they had with their master, they said, I want to be your master forever. And the idea was they would be taken to the post of the doorpost of the master's house and a all a sharp instrument would be driven through their ear and an earring placed there as the mark of the bond servant and adam clark saw this as being the declaration lord because of everything you give me i am your willing bond servant verse 17 i will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving now once again before we saw it in verse 14 we find ourselves at the altar of sacrifice with the singer. He was happy and he was duty bound to proclaim his gratitude to God and to call upon him alone. And again, we understand how this was true in regard to the psalmist, but in regard to Jesus, it is fascinating to think how the sacrifice of Jesus in his suffering and crucifixion was not only a sin offering, which it definitely was. In addition, it can also be understood as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Jesus went to the cross thankful, thankful for the Father's goodness, thankful for the Father's strength, thankful for the Father's blessing. Jesus did his work at the cross gratefully. Now we conclude the psalm with the last two verses, verses 18 and 19. We read this in Psalm 116, verse 18. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 18 begins with the repetition of a phrase we saw earlier in verse 14. What's that phrase? I will pay my vows to the Lord. And we could say that this keeps us at the altar of sacrifice with some kind of public sacrifice of thanksgiving. There, as he says here, notice, in the courts of the Lord's house. That's in verse 19 the psalmist would proclaim his praise and his gratitude towards God. And he would do it now in the presence of all his people. You see, the um, agony he went through, he had to go through it all alone. Everybody had forsaken him, but the victory that he enjoys, he proclaims it to everybody. I like what Alexander McLaren had to say this. He said, Grief is a hermit, but joy is sociable, and thankfulness desires listeners to its praise. So he suffered his grief alone, but his joy was proclaimed, and it's proclaimed even with the last line of the psalm where he says, Hallelujah, or as we read it in translating into English, praise the Lord. The psalm ends with Hallelujah, both as a declaration of personal praise, but it's also a call to all of God's people to join with the proclamation. It's as if he says, let's say it together. Hallelujah. Now, as we come here to the end of Psalm 116, we genuinely do praise the Lord, just like it tells us to do in the last line. And we do so because in so many ways, this is a powerful psalm pointing to Jesus, and it is especially meaningful as he almost certainly sang this song with his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. At the end of our psalms, as we make our way through the psalms in these teachings, 
we've been considering at the end of each psalm, how does this psalm point to Jesus? And usually I give two or three ways that the psalm may point to Jesus. When I think about Psalm 116, are, are, are you kidding? Are you joking? The entire psalm speaks so powerfully of Jesus. Let me just read to you many lines from Psalm 116. And I want you to think of how prophetically true they are in the life of Jesus, especially as, as I said before, he almost certainly sang this psalm right before his crucifixion. Ready? Verse 1. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. You, you can picture Jesus saying that, can't you? I'll continue on verse 3. The pains or cords of death have surrounded me. Verse 4. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, merciful. Verse 6. I was brought low and he saved me. Verse 7. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Verse 8, you have delivered my soul from death. Verse 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 13, I will take up the cup of salvation. Verses 14, and it's repeated in verse 18, I will pay my vows to the Lord. Verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Verse 16, O Lord, truly I am your servant. Verse 16, you have loosed my bonds. And then verse 17, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, every one of those lines from Psalm 116, of course it was true in the life and the experience in some measure in the psalmist, the author of Psalm 116. But is not each one of those lines that I read to you perfectly fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially his work on the cross? And how meaningful, how meaningful that he spoke and sang and prayed these words on the night of his betrayal and arrest, the night before his crucifixion. Let's pray and thank the Lord for this. Lord, when we read such a beautiful, such a powerful, and such an amazingly prophetic psalm, our hearts are moved. And all we can do is respond with the thought we see in verse 13, I will take up the cup of salvation. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all you have done to rescue us, to deliver us. Lord, you have called us unto yourself and you did it all through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, even though there is much we want to do for you, it begins with us simply receiving from this great cup of salvation that you so graciously offer to us. And we do that, Lord, thankful before you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.